um, this Veterans History Project interview uh, is being, con being conducted on Tuesday, September the 25th in the year 2018 18. here at the Niles, Maine District Public Library. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea and I'm speaking with Mr. John B. Andres, Jr. Mr. Andres was born on December the 23rd, 1947, and now lives in Chicago. Chicago. Although I understand his daughter has just moved to... Right. Just moved to Niles. Moved yeah. to Niles. Uh, and uh, Mr. Andres learned of the Veterans History Project through our veteran group at Dunkin' Donuts, which meets every Tuesday at Dunkin' Donuts here in Niles. And um, Mr. Uh, Andrews has not only kindly consented to be interviewed, but he's a patient man because he, uh, <laughs> he was among the first people to respond uh, to our invitation to interview for the Veterans History Project. Uh, the Library of Congress is anxious that we uh, record the memoirs of service of our Vietnam generation about the last of the citizen soldiers. Uh, for posterity, so we're uh, delighted that he's come in here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, um, we're going to follow a series of questions that's recommended by the Library of Congress, okay. and uh, sometimes you we uh, you answer some of them in response to a previous questions. So, but anyway. Okay. Um, so the the first question is, uh, Mr. Andrews, when did you enter the service? I was drafted in January of January 30th. I went in of 1968. Did that come as a big surprise to you being drafted? No, I knew I was getting drafted. I, you know, I was 1A, I, I was just waiting to go. Everybody was going at that time. Everybody was getting their draft. And it was just waiting the mail, waiting the mail. And I got my letter on January 4th of 1968, and there it was. And, and they told me to, to come down there on the 30th of January to 5, 615 West Van Buren Street and start the process. That was so it. how old were you at that time when you went in? There? I was 20 years old. At 20. That time. So what had you been doing before you were drafted? I was a printer. I, w I was uh, working at a print shop in the neighborhood, I, you know, just uh, learning how to do the printing stuff and getting my, you know, starting my job career. Yeah. What high school did you attend, if I may I, I went to Schur's High School. Oh, Bulldog. Yeah. I went, I went to DePaul Academy for a year, and then I transferred over to Schur's and finished my high school education at Schur's. Graduated from Schur's in January of 1967, and then got drafted in January of 1968. It took a year. Yeah, was there? Um, were you an only child, or no? I've got a I've got a twin sister, and I've got a younger sister and a younger brother. But you were the one that was. Uh, I was the I was the only one. How did the one family that feel about that? Uh, better better me than them, I guess. <laughs> was there a tradition of military service in your my family? Dad, my dad served in World War II. And uh, uncles and you know. Yeah, so they would have understood, and it was. Yeah, oh yeah. And were they also army people? E yes, I had a, I had an uncle who was uh, in the navy, and uh, most of, of of them were all army though. So um, if you're if you knew you were going to be drafted and you were, you didn't mind being drafted into the army. No, I you know I I knew I was going to go. It was just let's get it over with. You know, let's get it over with and get two years done with, and then you can continue on with your life. So what were your first days like in the, in the Army? The first day I got down there, I got down there early in the morning, and my dad kept telling me all the time, I don't worry about it, it's not bad, it's not, there's nothing to it. And he, we left the house in Logan Square at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. I was supposed to be down there at 6. And uh, we pull in front of the induction center at about uh, 5.30. And my dad didn't say anything the whole way down there. And I looked over to him, and he was crying. And I, and I, I kind of took me as a shock. I said, "Wait, have you been lying to me? <laughs> what, what am I getting myself into here?" And he says, "Just go ahead and do it." He says, "Don't volunteer for nothing." He says, "Just do your job." That, that was his words to me. I got out of the car and I went into the induction center. I got into the induction center. My last name began with an A. I was processed right away, and from six o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock that night, I dumped the urine samples in the sink all day long. That was my my first thing, first day in the Army, and I, I'm going, ah, boy, this is not a good start. I don't like this already. But uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a day. It was quite a day. So at this time, um, 
things are hot in Vietnam. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, it was Viet, uh, Tet had just started. Did not didn't did, hadn't started yet. I, this was the the thirtieth. Uh, Tet was just starting up there, but there were no cell phones at that time, no news. I didn't hear any news about it. I didn't know what was going on. And we left we left the induction center that night. We all got on a bus, and it was a it was a January January 30th. It was not it was not real cold. It was a rainy, overcast mm -hmm. yeah. day. Yeah, and we they took us out to the airport to O'Hare, and we got on an airplane and flew to St. Louis, which was you know our 45 minute flight, and got off in St. Louis, and then we got on a bus, and then that took us to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And uh, got to Fort Lunderwood, Missouri, and you know you, you check in there. You stay in your your little group that you're with, and then they mess around with you all night long. They, you know, you got to play the army stuff, and you know, harassing you all night long, and getting you ready for getting you ready for army life. And and then the following morning, you went to the mess hall. They fed you, and then you went and got into your groups, and then you met your drill instructor. And this, you're going to your company, and is he a nice guy? I'm to see. He was a character. He, you know, he came up as his first thing. He came up. We, we, could, we were standing there, and he gets off the bus, and he was pretty strapped. You know, he was a strapped drill instructor, and he got up there, and he said, "Gentlemen," he says, "I want you to know." He says, "My name is Sergeant Bernard Highstand." He says, "Approximately right now, there are maybe anywhere from 45 to 60,000 troops here at." Fort Leonard, Missouri. He says, I'm the baddest motherfucker here. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> was that true? That was true. That was, the, that was the first thing he said to us. And then introduced himself to us, and then we went to, to our barracks and told us what he expected of us, how we were going to work things. We were in the new bar barracks at, at Fort Leonard, which, which was pretty nice. We had rooms of, I, I believe there were eight guys to a room. And it was all alphabetical order. So I was with Aplanap and uh, uh, Anders and uh, a couple more A's and a couple B's. And, but there were eight guys in our room in basic training. So you kind of, you know, well, you're here. You might as well make the best of it. Best of it. So you, you started meeting the guys and, you know, where, where are you from? Where neighborhood are you from? Where's this and where's where's Was it that? mostly from Chicago? Mostly right? from Chicago. Draw? Yeah. yeah, most mostly the guys. Was that the first time you were ever away from home for a lengthy period of time? Yes. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, everybody got to know each other, and it took maybe a couple days, a couple days, and then you went down and you took some tests, and you went and they fitted you for your clothes, and you started getting to know the guys, and then on the third day. They took everybody down to get haircuts, and they cut all your hair off. And everybody looked different, so you didn't know who was who then. <laughs> you had to learn everybody all yeah. over again. So uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it, they broke you down, first of all. You know, they, they wanted to let you know that you were in charge, and your feelings are, didn't, make, didn't mean a thing. Yeah. Didn't, did not mean a thing. Uh, but they, they got you ready for, for the discipline. And it was it was all games, you know. After looking at back on it, you know, it was it was all games. So you were in pretty good shape, and oh yeah, I was I was in great shape. I could run all day long. I, there were some kids there who weren't. They got picked on, you know. They they were they were scorned and pulled out of line and and picked on, and they were the road guards. You know, every time you'd go in formation and walk along, you'd march, and every time you came to a, a intersecting street. The platoon sergeant would call out road guards, post, and the road guards would have to go out with their stop signs and stop traffic so you could go through the intersection. And it was always the big fat guys because they had to do a little extra running all the time. So, but uh, yeah, you learned to live with it. And uh, uh, it, the weather was, Missouri was cool, not as cold as Chicago in January, but it, but it was. Uh, it was cool. So that basic training, is that six weeks or? That was six weeks, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was six weeks and that was just your get used to army life. It had nothing to do with what you were going to do later on. You were, after basic training, then you were picked on, I don't know how they picked you on, if you were going to go to artillery, if you were going to go to infantry, if you were going to go I'm to I'm always wondering about car. that. Yeah, it was, I, it was a random crapshoot, I guess, you know. And, uh, 
forget, I'll never forget the night it came down when we were getting ready to find out what our MOS was. MOS meant your military op op occupational service. Uh, first, first, time, first thing that came down, they read off the infantry guys, guys going to infantry. I wasn't on the list. Did that feel good? Oh my God, I was, I was, I was in heaven. I, you know, I was, I was holy smokes. I, didn't, I, I went down to the PX. I stood in line at the, at the PX for an hour to use the telephone, and I called home and I, and I told my mom and dad, I, I said I didn't get picked for the infantry. I, 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 I missed it. They, I didn't get. They didn't call my name. The next morning, we had another formation. My name was the infantry going down to Fort Leonard, going, going down to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Andres, I was number one on the list. So, and it was kind of disheartening, you know. It was, it was, it was pretty disheartening, you know. What, but when I got drafted in January of '68, World War II didn't last that long. I did. They were already talking about downsizing Vietnam and, you know, peace talks. Yeah, peace talks yeah. and that. And I thought. I'll never get to Vietnam. No, it, it's, it'll be over before I even get there. So that was my attitude. So I got the infantry MOS. I went down to Fort Polk, Louisiana, which was a different climate, which was worse than Vietnam, to tell you the truth. Fort, Fort Polk was the, it was terrible. I mean, it was it was terrible. It was down in the swamps of Louisiana. It was hot and humid and bugs and and then you were they were constantly harassing you and so that was another the, the officers the officers yeah. and, and sergeants and your, your, your NCOs your, your drill instructors and you'd go through your training and then you taught your you were taught your basic infantry tactics you know and which nobody knew what they were doing you know it was six weeks of bullshit you know, they were teaching the basic stuff. If you weren't in, didn't know it before, you didn't learn anything on there. So it was time to graduate from AIT. And I went, you know, I said, Vietnam is right around the corner. And it's, and I'm not trained well enough to go to Vietnam. Whoa! It, got, it hit me then, and I went, I went you know, I'm, I'm probably going to go there. So I went to my first sergeant, and I said, you know, I said, uh, I trained well enough to go to Vietnam. I said, is there anything else I can do to get more training? What was the reaction to that judgment that you were rendering about your, the quality of your training? I, I just told him the truth. I what said, did this he is, say? You know, and, and he says, well, this is the way we do it here. This is the way it is. You go to basic training, you go to AIT, and then you go to Vietnam. And that's what these guys were doing. They were going six weeks of, of basics. Six weeks of AIT, and then you were off to Vietnam. You got a 30-day leave, and then you were off to Vietnam with just that much training. So I went to my first sergeant, and I told him, I said, you know, I said, I don't think I'm trained well enough to go to Vietnam. I said, what recourse do I have? And he, and he told me, he said, well, he said, I'm looking at your records here. He says, uh, you did pretty good on the aptitude test and that. He says, uh, you, could, you qualified. If you want, you can go to NCO school. The only thing with that going to NCO school, you had to volunteer to go to Vietnam. No, I was going to Vietnam anyway. I might as well get the extra training and go over there as a sergeant rather than as a PFC. But if you hadn't asked, I you wouldn't would, have known I that option. Wouldn't have known no. that option existed. No. So I I signed up to go to NCO school. Went to NCO school, which turned out to be the best thing that I ever did. It. It probably saved my life. It was intense training. I learned a hundred times more than I did at AIT. AIT was just fun and games. It was just stupid little run around and play army, just like you did when you were a kid. NCO school, went to classes during the day. You sat there for eight hours. You, it was drummed into your head. You got to know the feeling how an infantry squad worked and what they wanted you to do. And learned how to read maps. I saved my life ten times. I mean, I was a pretty good map reader. I did pretty good. You had to call in artillery. You had to know where you were at all the time. It was really beneficial to learn how to read a map. And was that also in Louisiana? That was, that was at Fort Benning, Georgia. 
Okay, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia for NCO school. And NCO, how long was it? NCO school was uh, 12 weeks. NCO school was 12 weeks. And then, did I mean, the training was excellent. They covered everything. They showed you what to do. Everybody took their chances taking the school. Take, take, took turns taking the squad out, and you ran the squad for the day. So you had to go out, and they would have mock battles, and you would have to perform, and, and you were in charge of the squad. And it taught you how to survive firefights, how to survive, you know, calling airstrikes, how to when you when you had to call in artillery. Uh, it, it was intense training. It was it was intense training. And I think that if everybody would have had that much training, there wouldn't be 65,000 names on that wall. Wow. I mean, it was... Because the thought was occurring to me, with, with your experience at officers, or the NCO training, if you could take some of those lessons and build them into the training for the yes, previous soldiers, exactly. whether it would have I mean, improved these, performance. These kids yeah. were going over there with not knowing anything. Yeah. Not knowing. And when you got to Vietnam, you were nothing. You were a, a, an FNG, all right? I didn't care about you. If, if you got killed in the first FNG, team, is that thing no good? Fucking new guy. Mm. Okay? And if if you got killed the first two days, first three days, you were lucky. You got out of it now. That's the way everybody felt at it. Nobody came up to re really be your friend or anything. So when you're in, when you're, do you complete the, th the three months in... Fort Benning. Fort Benning, right. Is that where you're assigned to the airborne? airborne? We, the day we graduated from NCO school, which was 50 years ago yesterday, wow. we had a formation out there, and the guys from airborne school were standing out there. And the guy came up there, and he got up, and he says, okay, he says, this is it. He says, anybody want to go to jump school? Stand in this line over here. He says, if not, this is your last chance. So I'm standing there, and a couple guys came up to me, come on, let's, let's go to jump school. Are you guys crazy? Are you are you nuts? Are you go, come on, let's go to let's go to jump school. He said, We've been together this long. You're not gonna turn your back on us now. You're not leaving us now. Come on, let's go to jump school. So I, I, I you know, my first thought was, well, you know, if, if I can luck out and maybe break an ankle, break a leg, that'll keep me out of Vietnam even longer. I was only in for two years. I'm already spending a year in training, so the longer I can put Vietnam off the better, but it never worked out. But by now then, Vietnam is looming oh, larger and larger. Right you're, there. You're, Vietnam now is, you know uh, that this is I'm, the, I'm on people my way are getting Vietnam. I'm, turned yes, up. I'm on my way to Vietnam. I, I knew then the Tet Offensive, yeah. that the war was picking up. And but this was, idea that you're NFG when you get, you know. Right. Did you know that before you got to Vietnam, or you just sent no, it like the no, first or second day? Yeah. Do that afterwards. Yeah, yeah. But, but that wasn't so much the case in the unit that I was assigned to. Uh, when I, when we we went to we went to uh, finished NCO school, then we went to then we went to uh, jump school, and that was and jump school was three weeks, and that was in that was in Fort Benning, Georgia. Also. In fact, Fort Benning, Georgia, jump school was a mile away from NCO school, and at that time, you got you, you got jump pay, you got uh, travel pay, you got six cents a mile from your where you're going jumping. This was this is a, a United States Treasury Department check for six cents. for six cents. <laughs> that was my travel pay to go from NCO school to jump school. The army. I never cashed it. That's no, the no, economy no, yeah. is so screwed up. Yeah. So so I got to my got to my jump unit and again we were all together. Jump school was a little tougher. Jump school, the physical training was it was intense physical training. First week was ground week. First week was PT, running, and PT, and running, and PT, and running. That's PT being physical, physical training? Physical training. That's all you did. That was it. The second week was tower week. Tower week, they taught you, you went down and you did mock towers. They showed you how to exit an airplane, how to fall and roll, do PLFs, parachute landing falls. Taught you how to use your five points of contact. You you hit with the balls of your feet, with your uh, with this, uh, your calf, roll onto your hip, up to your side, onto your shoulder, and then up on your feet again. That was your PLF, your five points of contact. They drummed that into you. You practiced that all day long, and then Tower Week also you went through the 34 foot tower, and it was 34 feet up in the air, and it was a mock 
airplane door. And it was, you'd, you'd hook up to this airplane door, to the, the cables going out the airplane door, and you would jump out with your parachute harness on, and you would slide down the cables all the way down to the end. It was just to get your body position right coming out of an airplane. Because you had to have your body, because when the old prop propeller driven airplanes that they were using at the time, if you came out all helter skelter, the propeller, propeller blast would catch you and flip you all around. And then when your parachute deployed, you'd get your feet caught in the in the in the risers and and you'd get all tangled up. And that's how guys got hurt. So everybody paid attention in these classes. There was nobody sleeping in these classes. So they taught you how to come out. You'd come out in a tight body position. You'd count to three. And then you could feel the jerk, that was your parachute opening, and you would slide down the wires, and you would do that seven, eight times a day. And then you graduated, you got that down, you graduated to the 250-foot tower. Now, the 250-foot towers were like the ones at Riverview, the old parachutes at Riverview. But these were, you went to an actual parachute, and the thing came down and, and picked you up on the parachute, and it pulled you up. And unlike Riverview, you were not... When it hit the top, you weren't tethered to anything. And I was more scared of the 250-foot tower because everybody had horror stories about guys slipping the wrong way, slipping their chute the wrong way, and they were going, crashing into the tower and getting hung up into the tower. But it was all horror stories. You just paid attention to your jump master. And you'd get to the top, and you'd get in, they'd hook you up, and you'd come down, and, and it'd sit there for a second, and you'd feel it, and then... Jump master would go, okay, and you'd give him a thumbs up, and it'd pull you up. You'd start going up. And on the way up, he's talking to you through a megaphone. And he's going, okay, according to which way the wind is blowing and which arm of the tower you're on, prepare for a left parachute landing fall. So what you would do if you wanted to, to go left, if you wanted to go left, you pull down on your left risers, and you'd pull them, you'd get four risers going up, okay? Two on each side. You would grab both on and you'd pull them into your chest. What that would do, it would cock the parachute and let the air out. And when the air was going out this way, it would push the parachute that way. So if you wanted to go away from the tower and the tower was to your right, you'd slip to your left and it would, and it was very easy. I mean, it was, and you just got away from the tower and you just floated to the ground. And they had the dirt down there so churned up that you could land on your head and not hurt yourself. It was, it was pretty soft. So that was just to get you used to From a height being in an yeah, actual parachute. Yeah, yeah. And that was, I did that maybe twice. I don't think it was any more than that. And then the third week was jump week. The first, on Monday morning, you got up and uh, it was go down to the airfield, get your parachute. You went, you went into a big, big, they had a big room. It was a, a big like Quonset hut. And they had tables up that were maybe were twice as long as this one here. And they were all packed with parachutes. And you would go through and grab your parachute. So you'd grab your parachute and you'd grab your reserve. And then you'd walk out, you'd run to the end and walk out the door. And at the end of the door, going out the door, they had a big sign up there. And it said, uh, our work is fully guaranteed. If it doesn't work, bring it back. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it said on so the, the first day, we, then we got your parachute, and you got into a cattle truck. They took you out to the airport. You got to the airport. To, you know, we were jumping C-119s, the old flying boxcars at the time. And they were out there all revved up. And then, you know, your jump master takes care of you. You're, you're putting your harness on. You're putting your parachutes on and everything. And, and you got your static line. These are all static line jumps. And you're, you're holding your static line. And it was time to get on the aircraft. So... Start walking over to the aircraft. The, the, the flight, the crew chief on the, on the plane, the Air, Force, the Air Force guy would motion you on the airplane. Everybody get on the airplane in the, in the stick number that you were in. They pre-did pre your stick number. They called it a stick, every jump. So there were maybe, maybe 20 guys on the outboard, 20 guys on the inboard, 20 guys on the inboard, 20 guys on the outboard on each side of the plane. So... You, you went in there, and you, you were sitting there, and now the plane starts taking off down the runway. And now everybody's got the same look on their face like, what the fuck am I doing here? And I went, oh, my God, man, you did some stupid shit in your life, but this is topping it all. 
So then you get up, you get up to cruising altitude, which all military jumps are 1,150 feet. 1,250 feet, I'm sorry. 1,250 feet. So you get up, jump master stands up, and they open the, the doors, on the jump doors on the side, and you can see the outside of the plane then. And, and uh, jump master gets up and he says, okay, uh, outside of the plane, hook up. And the cable running across the plane, you take your static line and you hook up to the static line. You hook your, cable, your static line onto the cable. And then turn to the right, you turn to the back of the airplane, and uh, it was uh, uh, check equipment. So you start checking your equipment. Make sure you're hooked into the cable. Make sure your parachute's on right. Make sure everything's done. The guy behind you is checking the back of you, your main parachute and everything. And then his next command is sound off with equipment check. And then it's okay, okay, okay. So everybody's all checked off on that. And then you're the first guy in line. The jump master goes, okay, number one, stand in the door. And then the first guy goes over and stands in the door. And then you sit there and wait for the jump command. And then you're standing there, and, you, and the whole world's going by, you know, and you're in this little door. And then his command comes out, jump. And jump, and jump, and jump. And then everybody's standing in the door, jump, jump. And you're just doing it automatically then. It's just following along. As soon as that guy goes out the door, you're next in the door. No, nothing to unhook or anything. It's nothing to unhook. You're go, already go. hooked up. You're, you're gone. gone. You're gone. And what, the, what it does, the static line, the static line, when you jump out of the aircraft, it pulls, it deploys your parachute. The static line stays in the airplane. It deploys your parachute. So when you get, I think it's 30 feet. When you get 30 feet away from the aircraft, it pops your chute out. And then, it, it always, you went out in a tight body position, and you went with your knees together, your feet pointed down, and you would jump out, and you would start coming back. You'd start floating back like this, and you could see the aircraft, and then, just about that time, your chute would deploy and it would pop you. And you could feel the pop, you know. And then you, the first thing, you check your static lines, make sure they're not twisted, make sure your parachute's deployed, is fully deployed. And, uh, you know, there were guys, and then again, there's guys on the ground talking to you through everything, okay. And, and, and it was, first, first couple of jumps, it was, uh, you know, okay, guy with, guy with the malfunction, pull your reserve. Everybody could pull their reserve because they were, they were scared to look. So a lot of guys, you know, it, it was it would there'd be reserves popping all over the place. It was the rough part about pulling your reserve. A lot of times it would get tangled in your main chute, you know, so you'd have to pull it down and throw it out. But as long as your main chute was open, you were good. What's the reserve? It's a backup. It's your backup parachute. Okay. That, that, that was right here on your. And stomach. you would activate that. If you would there. have to. Activate nothing it. automatically tied right. into that. You, okay. Yeah, it had, it had the rip cord on there. Yeah. Rip cord. Right. You, you would have to pull that to activate your reserve. But as long as your main chute was open, you were good to go. And then the guy on the ground would, would tell you, you, they had smoke down there, you, so you could see which way the wind was blowing. So you would slip in the opposite direction. And what that would do, that would slow down your airspeed. And because you were, you were going into the wind, you would, you would slip into the wind, which would slow down your airspeed. And all of my jumps, I could have stood up, but you had to fall down. You had to do a PLF. So now, after you did your first jump and you got on the ground, then it was, wow, this is pretty cool. So they took you right out and you did your second jump that day. And then you, I think it was a day off, and then Wednesday, you did your two other jumps. Now it's starting to get a little, you know, then you're starting to think a little bit more. You, I can get hurt doing this. So they, as you're going along there, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And on the fifth day, the last day, you did your equipment jump. You had all your equipment with you, your rucksack, your rifle, and you had all that stuff. And, and you could hardly move with all this stuff on. And it was such a relief to get out of that aircraft, just to get all this weight off you, that that was, that was the, the blessing for that, for that jump. But then as soon as you got out there, and as soon as those chutes deployed, Everybody was yelling at everybody, airborne, I'm airborne, I did it, I passed this thing. 
you know, so that was the, the accomplishment. That was, that was pretty cool. And I imagine that when you look back at the accomplishments in your life, if you had a name accomplishment oh, in your life, that's, that's probably that's in the top. A number one. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. A, a yeah. number one. That yeah. was, you know, jumps graduated from jump school. When they put those, when they put the silver wings on your chest, that was pretty special. Yeah. Didn't realize it till then, but that was there, a very special moment. Here's a silly question. Um, it doesn't matter how tall you are or what your weight is. It, that's not a criterion for being a, a, an airborne, right? No. Mm -mm. No, mm -mm. no. No, but, uh, but there was, uh, on my second jump, my second jump, I was the second guy in the slip. Okay, I was the second guy in the slip. And I jumped out of the airplane, and everybody else on the plane is, I'm, I'm up, I got stuck in a, like an air pocket. Oh. All right? So I'm... I'm hanging up there, and the whole damn aircraft is down below me, and I'm going, oh, my God, I, you know, I'm, I'm not heavy enough to bring this thing down. <laughs> but finally, I got out of his air pocket and went down. It was no problem, and, I, and my jump master told me that's what happened, you know, but... Uh, so that's air pocket. Air pocket. But it was, it, it, all my, all, all five jumps that I did in jump school were no problem at all. I, did, I used my training, did what they told me to do, and everything worked out fine. So then now you're a paratrooper, you know, and now you can do your strutting around a little bit. You can, you can strut around a little you bit. you got the silver... Silver wings, silver the basic wings. parachute wings, which was... Then you got to come home then for a little bit? Then I, I got, to, got to come home for, for a uh, leave, and then because I was an NCO graduate, now I had to go do my on-the-job training. And my on-the-job training was down at Fort McClellan, Alabama. So after my leave at home, I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama. And um, then all you do is you get a squad, and you take the squad through basic training. You're in charge of the squad. So for another six weeks, that's what I did down there. And did you follow the, the manual for yeah, the training, I, or did you try to no, build no, any of your I, insights? No, I, I did no. pretty good, and, and I just, I went by the book. Okay. I went by the book, and you, you know, you'd go out to the rifle range, you'd show them how to lock and load, how to, how to uh, sight in on a target, how to do that. You'd go Were out. these M14s? Or? M14s yeah. at that time. And, and you'd go out, at, you'd go out, and how to set up an ambush. Okay, you'd take your, you'd take your squad out, and you'd set up an ambush. And how to how to if you got ambushed how to react at an ambush, and just using all of those infantry tactics. I mean, I never thought that infantry you had to go to school to do it. I thought it was just a firefight and just shoot them up, bang bang. There's methods to it. So then I finished uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama, and now I, this was just about. Just about a little, about a year into the yeah. army. Just about a year into the army. So then I got a, a leave, uh, and I got a, a month leave to come home to go before I went to Vietnam. So I, I came home, and this was January of 1969. And January of 69, I got to uh, now all the, now in the meantime, all this that was going on when I was in basic and AIT. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Turmoil was, was Chicago, everywhere. Yeah. Chicago Convention yeah. was going on. And this thing called Vietnam was looming over my head. I'm going to war. And the night that I went, uh, the night that I left for Vietnam, uh, I had my buddies take me to the airport. I didn't want to have my mom and dad take me because I didn't want to go through that. But I was standing. We had an apartment over on uh, Spalding Avenue in Logan Square. And I'm standing in front of the mirror and I'm tying my tie. And I said, how do you do this? How do you, how do you, how do you go to your mom and say, Maybe. you know, I'm going to war. I said, you know, this is it. And so I went out and I said, you know, I said, well, okay. I said, I'm out of here. I said, I'll, I'll see you guys. And my mom goes, be careful. <laughs> you know. So, so then I get to Vietnam. And I went, to, I, went from, I went from Chicago. I went to there to Oakland, California. Oakland Army Base there. So I got to, I, I got to uh, San Francisco the first night. I spent the first night in San Francisco. Next day I went to the Air Army Base in Oakland, and you check in. And okay, so you your plane is leaving tomorrow at 6 a.m. You're flying to Vietnam. So got on a commercial airline, and you take off for the Netherlands. 
the Neverlands, you know. And, and we, we stopped first in Hawaii. And I, I went over there on, uh, on Flying Tiger Airlines. It was. I, I'll never forget it. It was Flying Tiger Airlines. And it was all, you know, just all guys going to Vietnam. It was pretty quiet. It was pretty quiet. And our second stop was in uh, Japan. And then we stopped in Guam. And then the next stop was Benoit Air Base in Vietnam. Now, we, when we came into Vietnam, you know, we, we, you, know there, you could drop a pin on the plane. Nobody said a word, you know. And, okay, gentlemen, welcome to Vietnam. And, and the plane landed, and they came out, and, you know, they got, got you on these Jeeps and everything, and the Jeeps were at chicken wire all over them so they couldn't throw grenades in there, which was... They were playing games with us, you know. They were just fucking with you. That, you know, it, it probably wasn't very dangerous there, but they made you think like you were at the war. So now they took you over to LBJ, which was uh, uh, the 22nd Replacement Battalion at Long Ben. And the 22nd Replacement Battalion, you would have a, you would have a, they signed you to a barracks, and you would go to a formation in the morning in a formation in the afternoon. And the formation in the morning, they would have a manifest out there. Okay, Jackson, Johnson, Balthazar, you. You guys are going to the 1st Infantry Division report over here. These guys go into the 9th Infantry Division, you're going over here. These guys, you're going to the 25th Infantry Division, you're going over here. These guys, you're going, whatever unit was in Vietnam, Marical, everywhere, they were all getting assigned. So I was there for three days, and my name was never called. You know, I'm telling you, geez, this is getting kind of old here, you know. So finally, on the, the third day, the morning formation, my name was called off. Andres, step in that line over there. You go into the 173rd Airborne Brigade. I didn't know what the 173rd Airborne Brigade was. and never heard of it, okay? So I went over to the first sergeant, I gave him my orders, and I said, okay, I said, uh, Andres, uh, US 5482648, and uh, I said, I'm going to the 173rd Airborne Brigade. And the sergeant sitting behind the desk was looking at my papers like this, and he looked up and he went, Buck Sergeant? He says, I hope you paid attention in that fucking NCO school of yours. And I went, what? What is that supposed to mean? Where the, what the hell is the 173rd Airborne Brigade? So I got on, got on, the, the went and got on the uh, Caribou. It was a small version of the C-130, and I was the only guy on the aircraft. And I flew up to LZ English. Was the only guy on. So I flew into LZ English and got off got off the plane, and they told me, "Well, you're going to Bravo Company First Battalion." Bravo Company First Battalion was 20 miles south approximately 20 miles south uh, down Highway 1. And it was at LZ Uplift. That was my unit. Now, I had to get down there. How do I get down there? Well, you just go out on Highway 1 there and you thumb a ride. That was it. That was how you got to Vietnam. That, that was it. You, you, weren't, you didn't have a weapon yet. You weren't at your company area. You had, you had nothing. So you had to go down to the road. And there were convoys going down the road all the time. And you, and you just, you know, I'm going Uplift. Jump on, you know. You get on, get on the, uh, get on the truck, and go in. So I went in, got into uplift, got to my company area, met my first sergeant, gave him my orders and everything, and uh, he said, "Okay." He said, "The whole company is out in the field." He said, "So you'll go out. I, I think tomorrow we got a resupply going out. You got clean clothes and you got mail and sea rations and ammunition." He says, "Just be down at the helipad in the morning, and you'll go out." So I went to the end of the arms room. I picked up my rifle, my M16. I picked up the ammunition, your your other stuff that you would need. You know, guys, you don't you don't need any underwear. You can't wear underwear out there anyway. You just get crotch rack from it. So just throw your underwear away. <laughs> just throw your underwear away. Uh, socks. They make sure you carry extra socks. Give you your canteens, your field gear, everything. You got all your equipment. Got down there the next day at the at the helipad. And uh, got on the helicopter with the mail and the rations and, and the ammunition and took off in the helicopter. Now, now I'm seeing Vietnam for the first time. First time in the light. You could see the hooches. You could see the, the palm trees. You could see the rice paddies. You could see the jungles. You could see the mountains in the distance. And now you're in the ship. You know, 
So we're going out in the helicopter. We were in the air maybe maybe 30 minutes. And we start coming down, losing altitude, and you can see poke, uh, smoke in the distance. And it was purple smoke, and the smoke was the guide the helicopter in. And then we're getting over, and you can see all the guys out there waiting for the helicopters to come in. You know, they, all the, the whole company was there. So the helicopter comes in, it lands down there, and one of the guys bringing the helicopter in, I was in NCO school with. Like I got off the helicopter, and right away I had a friend. I knew somebody, which was, I can't tell you what, how, what the, how that made me feel. You know, so we went over, renewed our friendship, blah, 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 and then I got assigned to my to second platoon. I met my lieutenant. I met the guy who I was replacing. I was in second squad, and the guy who I was replacing was, uh, he was from somewhere down south, Tennessee or Mississippi or something. His name was James Pig, P-I-G-U-E. So... You know, you get together, you get to know the guys. Okay, this is Joe, blah, 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 blah. This guy's from Tennessee. This guy's from New Jersey. This guy, and a couple guys you hit it off with real quick and, and that. And uh, then you settle down for the night in your logger site, and you spend your first night in the field. Are you in a tent or a... No, no. You, we never had nothing. We never had we, nothing. We had a poncho liner. Mm. We had our poncho liner. That was it. We had an air mattress. You never slept on an air mattress because they made noise. When you were in the logger site in a big company area, you could put your air mattress. But even though you're airborne, you're not anywhere near a plane or a no, field. No, you, you, you did not. There were no combat jumps made. In, uh, there was one combat jump made in Vietnam. That was in 1967 by the 173rd. But it was useless because the jungle, it was too much jungle. It was too, the terrain wasn't set up for airborne operations. But to go to the 173rd, you had to remain on jump status. So I got paid $55 extra a month and never have to worry about jumping. So one of the first days we went out, you'd go out and learn how it worked in Vietnam. So we were on patrol. We took this, the second dude went out on patrol. And my squad was leading it. And I'm now paying attention to this guy who's leaving in a few days. He's ready to go home. I'm taking over his squad. So I'm learning from him. I'm trying to... This is Officer Pig? Or this is Pig. Yeah. Sergeant Pig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm learning from him. So we came upon... We walked into a village. And we walked into a village, and the village was probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe 100 meters long. And at the end of the village, there were guys down there in uniforms. You know, and I, I, hey, look, there's some GIs down there. They weren't GIs. They were North Vietnamese soldiers. So I, and all of a sudden, everybody starts shooting and everything, and they took off, and they were gone because I gave them the warning. You know, they knew we were there. And uh, uh, this one guy comes up to me, a guy from New Jersey, and uh, he was uh, uh, Sergeant Bruce Coley. But he was spec for it. Coley comes up to me, he goes, Andres, he goes, you better stick around with me for a little while. You ain't never going to see Chicago. So, you know, I, they only told me they wore black pajamas. I didn't know they had uniforms. You know, like, so that was my indoctrination. Yeah, regular army. That was yeah. my indoctrination into my first patrol in Vietnam. And then a couple more patrols, we went out, we walked into a village, and we found a cache of weapons. And we found some uh, SKSs and some AK-47s. SKSs are? Are, are Soviet uh, single-shot rifles, okay. like a carbine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found some weapons, and we came up on another one. We had a tunnel complex, and in the tunnel complex, there was a piece of ordnance that was buried into the ground. So I called to the rear, and I called to my lieutenant, and I said, you know, I said, we got something up here, and, and I don't know what it is. It could be a 500-pound bomb, for all I know. I can't see the whole thing. And he says, oh, wait a minute, he says, we'll come out there. And so he came out, and he concurred with me. He says, ah, he said, we better not fuck with this. He says, let's call in the EOD team. So they called in the EOD team, and there was, they had the tunnel, tunnel complex. The EOD team came out, and they were putting down in the tunnels to render them useless to the Viet Cong or the NVA. They were putting 55-gallon drums of CS gas, powdered CS gas down in and then they would put the charges in there and everything, and they had all of this tunnel complex all filled up. It was probably maybe, maybe a block in area. And uh, then they called us off, 
off to the back, they come out there, they did the whole thing, you know, fire in a hole, fire in a hole, and bam, they hit the, the, the charge on this thing, and it was an explosion like I've never heard before. The ground shook. And then I look up, and there was shit everywhere in the air. I mean, there was pieces of rocks and, and barrels. These 55-gallon barrels were flying through the air. And I went, holy shit. And I'm, I hid behind this tree, and then I hear this guy yelling. And I turned him around, and it was Pig. And Pig got hit in the right leg in his calf with a piece of metal off of a 55-gallon drum. And it hit him in the top of his calf, and it peeled his whole calf off. All right? And it, was, and it just flopped open like a piece of meat. So I crawled over to him, and I put it back on him, and I grabbed his, his first aid bandage, and I tightened it up. And just then the wind shifted, and now we start getting hit with the gas. So everybody's crying. I, I grabbed them. I threw them over my shoulder, and we just started running. You didn't know where you were going. Just get out of that gas. So we finally got far enough away for the gas was ineffective. And we sat down, washed our eyes out, and Pig had all this gas, all this powdered CS in that open wound, and he was dying. So we called in, uh, called in a dust off, came out and got him, and took him away, and that was the last time I have ever seen, I've ever seen him. That was, he was gone. So now it was my squad. Now, now the, the, I, um, I had the squad. The ordinance or the shell or the mine, whatever it was that blew up, that you came across, yeah. was that an American? It was it probably an American, yeah. And they, and they, 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 they were using that for the tunnel. They, they used the it for a booby trap. They, no, oh, they, they used it for a booby trap. That yeah. was, it was a booby trap at one of the beginnings of the tunnel that it was you know, pressure detonated. It, it was probably a 105 round, but... But you didn't know that it was there. I didn't that. I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an ordinance expert. All I knew it was a, was a artil artillery round, or it could have been bigger. It could have been a 500-pound bomb. Probably. I wasn't going to take any chances with it. So then the next day, you took your patrol out again. And the way we did it in the 173rd, you went out. Your squad was five-man. You had a five-man squad. All right, it was you, it was your RTO, your radio telephone you, operator. You had a radio with you all the time. You had a grenadier who carried the M79 machine gun, and you had two riflemen. And you went out and you did patrols. Now, if you had the morning, if, had, if you had a patrol in the morning, you would take your patrol out in the morning and just patrol the area. They, you went talk talked to the lieutenant in the morning, and this is where we want you to take your patrol. We looked it on the map. You had your reference points on your map, so you knew where to call in fire from and you, to pick out your reference points. And you would take your patrol out in the morning, and if you didn't hit anything or nothing came about it, then you'd come back into the logger site in the afternoon where the platoon was at. You'd come in, and the other squad then would have the afternoon patrol. And then that night, which meant that night you had ambush. Ambush, well, I hated ambush. I just hated ambush. Am, ambush screwed up my whole day. It was, you would go out, you would go out on ambush, you would walk out at about just as it was started getting dark at dusk. And you would go out with your five guys, your five guys. You would go out and you would pick your ambush spot. You would try to look for a heavily traveled trail, okay? You'd have to have some cover back here where you would hide. Okay, and then, okay, this is where I'm going to set my ambush up. Now, now you go and find a rallying point where if you have to blow that ambush, you just take off and get to your rallying point. And that's where everybody goes to get mustered up so you know you got everybody. Because you never wanted to fire your, am your, your rifle in an ambush because they could see your muzzle flash and they knew where you were at. So you're, you're mining so or all you would do, you would, you would go back, and it would get completely dark. You would go back, find that spot where, you set your, where your ambush was at. You'd set your Claymore mines up. You had Claymore, Claymore mines. mines. You got your Claymore mines. They looked like, they always reminded me of a, of a, a Polaroid land camera. That's what they, they had a sight on them, and they were maybe that long, that high. They had two stake they had feet on them that you pressed into the ground. And they had a, a little sighting mechanism on there, just like a camera. You look through, and you would sight it on the trail. Okay. And now this, what this was, it was full of C4 explosives in the back. All right. 
Now, you had a back glass to it, so you couldn't have it pointed towards you. You had to have it pointed away from you and then down the trail. You would put one at each end of the trail, okay? And then you had a detonator with a cord on there with blasting caps that you would hook up to the, to the Claymore mine, and then you would drag the detonator into your position with you. And you would sit there all night with the detonator in your hand. And if you heard something come along, you would wait till it was, you thought, okay, they're in my kill zone, let's blow the ambush. Uh, I blew two ambushes the whole time I was there. But you never knew if it was one guy walking into your ambush or 301 guys walking into your ambush. It was kind of hairy out there, you know, and you were there with five guys, you were... You know, you were within artillery support. You were far enough away from your guys at night where they weren't going to come and get you. You had to get back to your rallying point. If you blew that ambush, you got back to your rallying point, get your guys together, and then try. Didn't want to go back into the logger site at night because these guys are fired up. They're all, you know, out there waiting for somebody to come in anyway. So you'd have to just lay out there all night long until you could come back in in the morning and let them know that you're coming, coming back in. So... I mean, I would, I would hate ambush. I, it just, I, I couldn't, if I had ambushed, it ruined my whole day. I, I'd be on edge all day long. So how many times a week might you have ambush? We, well, it got to the point where we had to do it every night for a while there. But it was, it, the first couple times I'd be, I'd be sitting down there and I'd be feeling right. And, and this guy Coley would always come up and go, hey, Andres, what's the matter with you? And I'd go, fuck, man, I got ambushed again tonight. And he goes, well, you come on, man. He says, it's, a, it's what you get paid for. You got to do this stuff. And he go, and he said, besides, he says, remember when your mother used to tell you, don't go out looking for trouble? He said, well, your mother's not here. He says, come on, we got to go look for some trouble. <laughs> so that's how he explained it. So you're out there through the night. Through the night. And you would take turns sleeping. So the sun, the sun is coming up. Yeah. And there's no ambush. No ambush. You didn't you pull your, your claymore yes. mines. You would you pick up your claymore mines yeah. and take them back with you. Yeah, you never left anything behind for the enemy. Never, never, never. So, or, and, or you, you also, you'd put out a couple trip flares to first let you know somebody's coming in. You know, the trip flare would go off and, and a, the light would, would burn. And you, a wild animal never set anything off. Yeah, every there. now and then they yeah. did, yeah. yeah. But every, every now and then they'd trip a trip flare. But uh, you, you got to the point so where... Was that a deer or a water buffalo? Or a you know what? I never saw a deer. I saw a water buffalo. Okay. I saw a, uh, a leopard, a black panther. I saw a couple wild pigs. Never saw too many, maybe one or two snakes, but they weren't. But it, it, was, it was strange because you'd have explosions going off all the time. You had guys getting into firefights. You'd, you'd get on patrol, would, would hit another an NVA patrol, and there'd be a firefight. And most part, all the animals were, were gone. I mean, they, they didn't hang around. So, uh, spider, I mean, the bugs were uh, terrible. I mean, you used to, sitting out there at night on ambush, you would sit there and you'd be, you'd, do I hear something? You know, and it's completely dark. Oh, yeah, Completely you quiet. Yeah. Completely quiet. And, and then, then the mosquitoes are in your room. And you're trying to, God damn it, I think I hear something. You know, and and uh, and, you're, and I always thought that they were going to hear my, my heart pounding, or I was going to shit in my pants. I mean, it was that scary. Yeah. I mean, you Did know? you have any infrared weapons or night scopes? No, no. no. We we had we. They were just starting to bring them out there. We had a, a, a starlight scope that they had, where you could look through it, and and just from the illumination of a star would would brighten it up, where you could see somebody walking. Took it out maybe one time. It was big and bulky. So this is this is really intense. And oh stressful. yeah, I mean you so were you, you your get asshole a, was that big all night yeah. long. So did you get a like an R and R or a break somewhere in there? No, no, no. You got you did this for until it was your turn to go on R and R, which was some guys. I it took me. Uh, I went on R and R in September, so it was nine months before Whoa. I got on R and R. Yeah. But I we and we were in the bush all the time. We got back to uplift. They tried to get us back in once a month. Where you would go back in and get clean clothes, you would get you know a shower, go and get a shower, and otherwise you would clean up. Yeah. You'd go into a village, and every village had a had a well in there, so you'd wash up the best you can. It was tough getting washed up. As soon as you washed up, though, that's when the mosquitoes killed you. 
it was better to stay funky. You know, and besides, they, they, you, nobody used that scented soap because they could smell you. So you would use laundry soap. Laundry soap had no, no scent. You didn't use, didn't use after shave lotion. You didn't use. Uh, we had a couple guys that smoked a pipe, and pipes were you never smoked a pipe out in the field either because you could smell that well. And we, we always kind of refrained from smoking cigarettes also. Now, I, I was a cigarette smoker at the time over there, and and but. You weren't to do without that. Could you get a beer to relax? No, no, no we no. never. We, you, you could get, we had a beer. The beer would come in sometimes. You'd get resupplied every three days. So you'd get mail would come out. Is that coming in the helicopter? In, in the helicopter. Mail would come out. Your sea rations would come out. Uh, so you're eating sea rations? Sea rations all the time. Sea rations. Were well, you losing weight? And we're fresh. No, they were pretty good. Uh -huh. they, they were, you, you learned to eat pretty well over there. They, were, they had lure rations that they called. They were uh, freeze-dried. Meals, which some of those were pretty. When you say LURP, is that L U R P? L R R P, R P, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. And what it was freeze dried, so all you would do, you would boil water, pour it in the package, and it was meal. They call them MR, MREs now, meals ready to eat. So you just add hot water, and, and you got. You, they had, they had spaghetti. They had spaghetti. They had uh, 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 beef and rice. Chicken and rice, chili con carne, which no matter how long you let that soak, them beans never got soft. Never. You could let it soak for two days and the beans never got soft. So guys would be sitting there picking the beans out before they put the water in there. So you got mail then from home every now and then. Got and mail you from, mail came out every three days. And if you sent and mail you, home, it would you, come. And then your mail would go out on that helicopter. And, no uh, censoring or anything or no, no 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 and and I used to get quite a bit of mail I had I had a real good girlfriend back home that she would send me stuff all the time and uh, you know sending me a care package with uh, pepperoni in it and my standing order to my mother was all the time that just send me a bottle of open fit barbecue sauce and a raw onion at least once a month. You know, and that, that would supplement my sea rations and my lure rations and dress them up a little bit. I learned to love Tabasco sauce. Uh, they, they had the, the sea rations were just little tin cans, and you'd pop them open, and you'd make a little stove out of, an, uh, out of a, a used-up can, and you'd put a little piece of, uh, we had C4. We used the C4 burned real, real, real hot and real bright. And C4 would, would boil a canteen cup full of water in like eight seconds. So you would, you would heat up your food, and then they had heat tabs, too. Heat tabs were, it was a chemical, it was a tab, but about that long, and it was purple. And you'd break off a piece and light it, and you put your canteen cup over there and heat your water up, and that's the way, that was it. That's the way you ate. But everybody was in the same position. Nobody had it any better than you did. You slept in the same mud. You slept. You, you dealt with the same bugs. Uh, was that um, the calamity, the in injury suffered by um, Sergeant P? Pete? Yeah. Was that the worst um, casualty that you? Were no, no, pig. No, pig. that was pig. No, no. We we got guy. We had a few guys killed. That we had some. You know, you go out and you had. We had. I'd say the year that I was there, the amount of time I spent actually shooting at somebody where they were shooting back at me, maybe 15, 20 minutes. That was it. I mean, you would, you would be scared for five days straight and nothing happened, and then just seconds of complete horror for as long as it took until they broke, or until you killed them, or until they broke. But, you know, you're on patrol all the time. You would run into a, a squad of them walking along, okay? And then... It, all shit would break loose. Maybe the uniform. North Sometimes Vietnam. the uniform. Mo the most of the time we dealt with up there with, with was North Vietnamese regulars. We yeah. didn't have too many Viet Cong by us. Yeah. That were, we were up in the mountains in the Central Highlands, and they were coming in from Cambodia and from Laos. Yeah. Were there mountain yard? Mountain yards. We had mountain yards by us too, which were, they were very, very good fighters. They, they yeah. were very. They was there any pot? Uh, oh yeah, there were. There was. Uh, you could get pot anywhere. So if you were a sergeant, you saw somebody smoking pot. Did you say anything? No, no. There was a time and a place for everything. Okay. If there's a pot, if they're smoking pot, that could be th a. There was a time and a place for everything. Okay. If you wanted to get high, 
You wait till we get back in the logger site when everybody's around. You don't do it when you're out in a five-man unit. You know, I want everybody to be number one. Everybody knew the rules. Everybody knew the rules, and those were my rules. You want to smoke pot? You wait to, you know, and I smoked the joint with these guys when we got to the rear. Yeah, it loosened it up a little bit. I mean, you had to have. Is there any tr any disciplinary problems with anybody that just mm, not too much? A couple guys, a couple guys. It was winding down, and, and uh, most of the time, it was the black guys, and I couldn't blame them. I mean, you know, these guys were still getting yeah. dogs sigged on them back home, and they couldn't get jobs. They were dying every day, just like you and me. And there was one incident one time. I had a guy in my squad, and his name was King. And King was down south somewhere. I don't remember actually what it was. Well, King started to become a radical in the 60s there. Wouldn't get a haircut. Wanted his afro to grow out, you know. And I, I'd say, King, I'd say, come on, man. You've got to get a haircut. And fuck, I he says, hey, this, is, this is the way a black man wears his hair. And I'm a black man. This is the way a black man wears his hair. I said, okay. So this went on for a while. And I kept putting up. And he got worse and worse as we went along. Got a little more vigilante and uh, a little more uh, radical. And uh, so finally we went back to uplift one time. You know, so when, well, now we're in uplift, we're in the big secure area. And uh, I went to my first sergeant. First sergeant Gatsy was a World War II, uh, World War, World Korean and World War II vet. And now he's in Vietnam. And he was a mountain of a man. This guy was six foot eight. I mean huge. A huge old, old hardcore paratrooper. And he was an E-8. And I went up to him and I said, Top, I said, I'm having trouble with King. I said, man, he's, I said, he's not, he's, you know, he's got all this radical bullshit and he's, and he's, uh, he won't get his hair cut. He's like, I've tried to get him to get his hair cut. He won't get his hair cut. I can't make him get his hair cut. And he goes, uh, okay, he says, bring him over to see me. So I went back to our company area. And I said, I said, King, I said, Top wants to see us. Let's go see Top. So, okay. So we walked over and walked into Top's office and, you know, and Top goes, what's the matter, King? I hear you're having problems out there. And he said, well, he says, Sergeant, he says, this is the way an African man, he says, this is the way we wear our hair. He says, I, and I'm an African man, so this is the way I'm going to wear my hair. And uh, First Sergeant looks at him, and he, and he backs off like this, and he goes, uh, okay, he says, uh, that's fine. He said, you want to be an African man? He says, go ahead. You don't have to get a haircut. Now my jaw dropped. I'm going, holy shit, man, Top's turning his back on me. So he's like, you're dismissed. And I'm going, holy shit. And we start out the door, and just as he gets to the door, Top goes, okay. He says, by the way, he says, he says, if you're going to be an African man, he says, you're going to be an African man 100%. He says, so I want you to turn your weapon in. You go down to the mess hall, get yourself a bone or something, and make a spear out of it or something, because if you're going to be an African man, you're going to be an African man 100%. King got a haircut later that day. So, but, he, it, but he was okay, but he, we were out on, on patrol one night, and he was going to get out of the field. All right. So we were in the logger site. The whole platoon was in the logger site. And King went off to the side, and he found a couple rocks, put pretty big rocks that were up next to each other, and they had a little cutout section in it. And he took an M M33 grenade, which was the baseball grenade, and it was a pretty powerful grenade. And he popped the pin and threw it in there and stuck his fingers around. He was going to blow his fingers off to get out of the field. Well, it took his whole arm off at the shoulder. Right, so we hear this explosion. Everybody's running around, and he, King comes running back into the logger site, and he's, his arm's gone. And I fucked up. I fucked up. Well, he got out of the field. He got his wish. So he didn't have to spend any more time in the field anymore, but he lost his arm. So that, that was the last I saw him. He must have been terrified to do that. He, yeah. And he's going to give up, lose a couple of he, fingers he was, to do it too? Yeah. I mean, there were, there were guys. There were guys out there that were shooting themselves in the foot to get out of the field. It was, it was terrible. It was a terrible, terrible place. And you were scared to death all the time. You're 20 years old. You're 19 years old. You're scared to death. You don't know what's going, you know, and you see a couple of your buddies get killed. It's... So you know, you're counting the days. Oh, you counted the days all the time. I got my calendar here. We, we counted the days. Every day you would count, you would... Uh, there, that's, that's my, there's, there's 1969. Every day of 1969 crossed off. You know, and the further you got into it, the worse it got. 
because if I get killed now and I got two weeks left, I'm going to really be pissed off. You know, and, they, and it didn't make any difference. You had to do the same thing every day if you had six months left or two hours. If you were still in the field, you had to do your duty. So nine months, then you got a, you got a break. Nine months, I went to uh, Singapore. Now, I was supposed to go to Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur was having uh, anti-war rallies there. So they decided to send everybody that was going to Kuala Lumpur Okay, you're going, you're going to Singapore, which Singapore was a pretty nice place. Singapore was, was here's, this is my, Singapore, Singapore was a very, I'm glad I went there. I got to see the, uh, this is my boarding pass to go to, to go to Singapore. Airline passenger ticket, baggage check. Now, and then when you got to Singapore, they took, we went to the hotel, we, I was staying at the a place called the Serene House. And you'd go in, and then Mama San had all the girls in there, and the guys would be grabbing all the girls and taking off. And I, you know, I didn't want to go get one of them real cutesy, cutesy girls because they probably they were with 300 guys. I'll take one that was with three guys. So I'm sitting in the bar that night, and we're we're sitting in the bar, and these guys all got the girls and took off, and it was me and one other guy in the bar. So I went over there and started talking to him, and and we had civilian clothes on by this time, and I'm talking to him, and and uh, yeah, I said, Come on, you going to get a girl? And he goes, no, he says, I'm just going to sit here and have my beer. And he says, that, that, he says, I said, what, what's the matter? You don't, you don't have any money? I said, I'll get you, girl. I said, I got some money. I'll give you. I'll give, I'll give. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. He says, okay. Well, anyway, okay. So I went and got my, my girl, and, you know, she was, she was real nice. She was a school teacher. And, you know, I told her, I said, what are you doing this job for? She goes, I got a, I'm a single mom. I've got a son. She goes, this is the only way I can support him. She was very nice. I mean, these other cutesy girls, were, they, they were having these guys spend their money on them. They were buying them dresses and radios and watches. And she never asked me to buy her anything. She was, and she, we did a lot of talking. She spoke perfect English. It was nice to talk to a girl. She was very nice. So now fast forward to going back to Vietnam. Now you're going back to Vietnam. You have, is this after a week? Or this is after a week, mm -hmm. after, after seven days. Seven days in Singapore, and she took me to all the places. She took me to the, all the. She took me to Tiger Bomb Gardens, which was Tiger Bomb is that stuff that you, it's an ointment that you put oh, on. Yeah. Where they sell it here. Well, they had a big, uh, like a amusement park over there with no rides, but it was all Oriental figures, and you'd walk through, and there'd be statues in there, and it was, you know, it was like being in Disney World in in Singapore. And she took me to a restaurant one night that was it was called the Paradise Restaurant. And it was out on the South China Sea. And it was like, we were sitting there eating, and I, the lobster, I had lobster, I had shark fin soup. Shark fin soup for the first time in my life. And I lobster, and I think the whole bill was $24 for the two of us. And it, it was, I was kind of like waiting for Dorothy L'Amour and, and uh, King Crosby <laughs> and Bob Hope to come in. It's and it looked like yeah, yeah. You know, the road to Singapore. It's what, yeah. It was just like that. So now we're going back to Vietnam, and get on the plane, and you got your uniform. So I'm sitting on the plane, I'm sitting in my seat, and the guy who I tried to buy a girl for comes walking on the plane, he's got his uniform on, and he's a chaplain. And I said, Father, I said, you got to forgive me. I said, I, he says, he says, don't worry about it, son, he says, I got a kick on it. I tried to buy a priest a piece of ass. <laughs> So that was, that was a highlight moment there. That was, yeah, that was pretty good. One. But, but Singapore was nice, and then it was... Right back to the... Right back to your unit. You right back, back to, to your ambush. Back to your unit and back out on ambush at night. Yeah, that was, that was it. You know, and you, and you didn't know if you were going to go back. I took... I, I forget how much money, but I, I swore that I was not going to go back to Vietnam with, with any money. So I, I spent it on everything. I, I gave my girl, I think, 100 bucks. Yeah. You know, just uh, here is... Take it. I had a good time with you. Thanks for doing everything, and and it was it was it was good. It was it was a fun time. I mean, you were out of the war for a while, but it was always in the back of your mind that you got to go back. And now, when we got back, uh, well, this was this was in September. It, the worst the worst time in Vietnam was the day Bruce got killed. My Bruce was the guy who told me that you you better hang with me or you're never going to see Chicago again. Bruce taught me everything how to survive Vietnam. Bruce taught me how to how to pack a rucksack, how to how to 
how to fold your socks, how to how to carry your canteens, how how much ammunition to carry, how how much how to do everything. It taught me how to survive Vietnam. At night, when you would pull guard, we always pull guard together, so we wouldn't have to be alone. You know, we'd be sit, we'd sit there and and we'd sit there and he'd, his back would be to mine, mine would be and be completely dark out there, and he'd be the only. You know, and, and we got through the night, every night like that. So one day we, we came into a new area one day, where we went right along the South China Sea, and there was a village. And I took a patrol down that afternoon, and Bruce stayed back. And I took a couple guys out. We had to go into the village and get some water. So we went into the village, and we get into the village, and there was a trail that branched off like this. And... I took the trail to the right, and we went down. The well was over here. So I went and got water. No problem. I had four guys with me. We got water. We filled up the canteens, brought the canteens back. And the next day, they wanted to go get some more water, So we, but we had ambush that night. And I was tired. And Bruce says, well, I said, I'll take, I'll take the patrol. I will go get, we'll go get water. And I said, ah, Bruce, I'm tired. And he goes, well, just about stay here. He says, just stay here. He says, uh, he says, we'll be back. Don't worry about it. So it was only, you know, 50 meters outside of where we were staying at, where the village started. So the day when I went to get the, the water there, there was an old woman there. And she was watching, watching me every day, which they always did, you know. So that, that day, Bruce took him and four guys out. And they took off. And instead of going to the right, Bruce went to the left. And he went to the left, and they got ambushed. And I'm, I'm laying back there, and I could hear the small arms fire, and, and uh, radio comes back. Hey, we got ambushed, Bob. And you could hear, pow, 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 pow. Well, it was probably maybe two of them. They just fired it. They had a, they had a, a claymore out there. They popped the claymore mine, and they uh, that they probably stole from the GI, and they fired them up a little bit, and then they took off. So I right away heard the rifle. I I, I all I, I didn't have shoes on. I had my pants on. That was it. I didn't have a shirt on. I grabbed my 16 and I took off. Took off running and I got down there and I get up to the thing and, and Smitty from Florida was laying on his stomach when I got up to him. And he had a hole in his back. And uh, and I said, you okay? And he goes, yeah. He says, I'm okay. He says, but you better go check on Coley. Coley was up on point. So I got up. To, I, get, I walked up a little further and I get up to Bruce and Bruce was laying on his right side. He was laying on his right side and he had his 16 between his legs. And uh, I, I, he, only, he only had two months left in Vietnam. And I said, hey, come on. I said, come on, man. You're getting too short for trying to get this ghost shit here, you know? And he didn't say anything to me. And I grabbed him and I pulled him over. And he was shot in the head. And I, I had him in my lap. And the whole back of his head was was leaking up that lap, and uh, uh, that was the worst, my worst bit. And uh, I came back and called in for uh, dust off, and a uh, uh, helicopter came in, I put him on a helicopter, and it was the last I ever saw of him. Now, uh, since I've been back, I've, I've been to his grave site in Freehold, New Jersey. I've... Uh, I've conversed with his family members. He was uh, he was a uh, you know he was a uh, uh, his dad and mom and dad were divorced. He was raised by his aunt. I've talked to I talked to his aunt, his aunt has since passed away. But I I now talk to his stepbrothers. I still hear from them every now and then. And uh, this was July the seventh, and that was the worst day. I mean, and then I was when I put him on the helicopter, and that helicopter took off. That that was my best friend. That was. Yeah. I mean, I was. Com I never felt so alone in my life. Yeah. Got to go do the same shit that night. You got to take a patrol out. You know, you got to go on ambush that night. So, and we start going again. And now the guy next worst time was was Lau Sergeant Lau, who was my who was who was the guy that I was in NCO school with. All right. We came back. They, we had to do. We were out for a couple of weeks, and we didn't hit any contact. So they, they thought we were out there. Hey, second platoon's fucking off out there. Let's bring them in. They were getting mortared every night from the mountains behind LZ Uplift. 
So they wanted to, uh, you know, it was re ruining their beauty sleep. So that, that, that's Bruce Coley. That's 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 my buddy. That's, and is that's that the, the airborne patch on it? Yeah, it's the one somebody third patch. Yeah. yeah. And uh, 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 so we came in, and they called us in on Halloween night too. And uh, you know, we we had a formation, and they you know they told us what was going on. We, we keep getting mortared every night from the mountains back over here. We want you to take second platoon. We want you to go out there and flush these guys out. You know, because we're tired of getting our sleep interrupted at night. So we had a walk about, we left, and we drew straws to see which, uh, which squad was going to push point. All right, so Joel's squad, Joel was in first squad, Joel had first squad, he pushed point. I drew the second shortest straw, I was the second squad back. So we left uplift at, at midnight, and it was maybe three quarters of a moon. It was enough to, well enough to see with. So we walked across, we had, we had about a quarter of a mile to go to get to the foothills. And we walked over to the foothills of, of the mountains and we started up the mountains that night. And uh, that's, that's Joel Lau, who I was in NCO school with. And, uh, we, you know, we're sitting there that night before we left and I said, I said come on now, I said, uh, you know, he had, this was November the 1st. Joel was scheduled to go home for Thanksgiving. So, uh, you know, we were talking, and I said, well, I said, this is, might be your last trip out there, huh? And he goes, yeah, he said, it could be. And, uh, and I said, well, I said, we're in good hands. He said, ah, don't worry about it, Andre. He said, I got point. Don't worry about it. So we walked all night long up, up this mountain, and, uh, you know, it was, you had a platoon with you, so you were making some noise. They knew we were coming. I mean, they, you, that moving that, big at night. They knew we were coming. Well, anyway, we walked all night long, did anything, and just as it was starting to get daybreak, just as, just as you could start seeing something, there was an explosion. His point man stepped on a pressure detonated 105 round. And he was a black guy. 105. And that 105 was an artillery round. And that was one of their... One of ours. Oh. It was an American-made 105 round. Okay, they, what they did, they buried him in the ground with the firing mechanism face up, and they put a firing pin over it like that. So when you step on it... it and that was the enemy that put that in. The enemy put that in. So it was pressure detonated. Now, when he stepped on it, he detonated the round. When I got up to him, he was, he was laying there, and his right leg was gone to here, and his left leg was off at about here. But because of the flash from the 105 round, it seared everything. See, he wasn't even bleeding. He was in shock. But he, so the medic got up there and we got him taken care of. And then I'm walking around and you could hardly see anything. And uh, you know, I see a body laying off to the side. And I pull him over and it was loud. And Joe had, he had a hole in his chest about this big. He had a piece of shrapnel hit him in the chest. Me and the medic got him breathing. You know, we put, put a poncho around him. You could hear his chest losing air put a poncho around him and, and got him breathing again. And a helicopter came in and put him, but he died on the way to the station. If you had drawn the shortest straw, would that have been? It probably would have maybe. been. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, there were times when, I don't know how, I, I mean, there were, there were, when I was in the mountain, there was, we were on patrol one day, and Bruce was behind me, and I'm pushing point, and it was a thick brush. You know, so I said, hey, Bruce, let me push point for a second here. He says, he says so I said, okay, he said, you know, give him a break. So I said, let me push point for a while. So I, I started off, and I wasn't gone maybe, not five minutes, you know, and I grabbed this, grabbed this bunch of uh, vegetation, and I pulled it away, okay? And right where you're sitting, right where you're, this far away, okay, there was a North Vietnamese soldier sitting there with his rifle like this. And I was far enough away where I couldn't lunge at him or anything, so I, I, the only conscious thought, I, I didn't want to see myself get shot. So I, I did this number. I did one of these, and I heard a click and a, right, and a rifle shot. And then I went, hmm, I'm still, you know. And I turned around, and he was arched back like this, and the whole top of his head was gone. Well, the click I heard, he was more scared than we were and didn't have a round in the chamber, and when he pulled the trigger, nothing happened. 
So I'd have been dead right there if he'd had so around. shot him? Bruce, behind me. You know, and then I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm shaking like this and I, you know, I'm, I went, holy shit. And Bruce goes, Andres, you're going to have to see him a little faster than that. You know, and then there was another time we were out on patrol and uh, I went with, I went with the first platoon and because we were going off in helicopters, it was a company of NVA in this village that we had to flush out. And we were going to be, we were going to be the pushing force. And the blocking force was going to be on the other side. So my squad went with them. So me and my RTO didn't have enough room on their helicopters. So we went with the first platoon, which was the pushing force. So we get up there, and there was maybe 100 meters from across the rice paddy to the village. Okay. So we, I'm up walking this rice paddy. And there was, a couple, there was a squad on the left of me and a squad on the right of me. My RTO, me, and another couple of guys were up on this rice paddy, so we're up a little bit higher than everybody else. And just then, we get hit with a crew-served weapon, a machine gun, from the village. So I fall down right away, and I'm laying there. Now, I got my feet towards the village. My RTO is next to me, and I'm laying there, and these rounds are hitting all around me. I could, the dirt was hitting me in the face, and I'm afraid to move because I, I knew I'm going to get shot, you know, if I move. So I'm laying there, and, the, and the, it's going bing, bing, and the rounds are hitting all around me. And then finally he stopped shooting. Now, whether he ran out of ammunition, whether his gun jammed, I don't, we never returned fire because he had us pinned down. So I turned around, and I'm, I, I, I went, Mac. I said, my, Mac was my RTO. I said, Mac, I said, I said you Okay. And he goes, yeah, Andres, I think I'm okay. And I said, and then all of a sudden my, my leg was wet. And I went, oh, fuck, I shot my leg. You know, and, and I could feel it was hurting. My leg was hurting. I said, oh, fuck. I said, Mac, get me, give me a medic up here. Well, yeah, I, I'm hit. And so he calls back and he wasn't getting anything. You know, his, his radio wasn't doing anything. I said, Mac, I said, I said did, you, did you change that battery in that radio? And I grabbed the radio on his back and I pulled it like this. And when I pulled the radio, he was hit four times in the radio. He had the radio on his back. And he, the, there were four rounds in the radio. You know, and I went, Mac, are you sure you're okay? And he goes, yeah, I think so. And, I, and so just then, another couple guys came up to me, you know, and he come, a guy come over to me and I, and I said, I think I'm hit, man. I said, get the, get the medic up here. So medic came up and medic rolls me over and he glitched down and all of a sudden he, I'm laying there and I'm going, Doc, I said, don't even tell me how bad it is. Just fucking bandage me up and get me out of here. And he goes, uh, and he starts laughing, you know, and I was like, what are you laughing about? And he goes, Andres, he says, uh, he says, your leg's okay. He says, but this orange is fucked. I had an orange in my side pocket and he shot the orange in half. <laughs> so that was another close call. But I mean, there were... And there the, the radio man, was he okay? Radio man was okay. It, the, round, the, 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 the radio saved his back. And he was being fired at with... Uh, with, with, a, with a probably a 51 millimeter uh, machine gun, a, a, a Chinese-made weapon that they had. This area where you're doing this um, very systematic repeat surveying and... Yeah, uh, doing patrol, running patrol. Yeah, what, what strategically, what's, what's that accomplishing for the, for the, well, for it, the effort at that it's time? It's making, letting them know that we're there so they cannot come in here and use this area to Stage. build up their strength, ah, okay? okay? Because when they were, they, they couldn't, they couldn't muster up any more than five, six guys because they, we'd see them right away. There was so much mm. air support, so much helicopters running around. We had so much patrols out there. We were saturating the places with patrols. And there were, there were times, we, we caught a guy one time, and uh, the 173rd had a reputation of they were cutting off ears of dead gooks after they were dead. And we caught a guy one day, and he was a courier, and we had our Kit Carson scout with us, and he read the thing, and they were going miles out of their way so they wouldn't have to come to our AO because they were afraid in Buddha religion, if you lose part of your body, you don't go to heaven. So they were afraid they were going to lose their ears, so they would not fuck with us. You know, so that, that's why they did it sometimes. They, well, they, you know, you couldn't, it was inevitable. Sometimes you'd, you'd stumble on them. They were there. You know, it, and that would have been something that a, an American soldier did? Yes, mm -hmm. and, it, and it happened. I mean, it was, it, it, it happened, but I mean, there were, it was, you know, there were, me lie could have happened every day, everywhere. Because you were in a firefight, you walked into a village, there was nothing there but old men, 
old women and little kids. There were no army age kids there. You know, so you knew all these people knew everything. They knew what was going on. They can't walk into your village and not know who's there or nothing. So, I mean, war is terrible. It was just terrible. And, you know, the, and the first time I seen a guy cut a guy's ear off, I, I wasn't into that stuff, you know. And, and uh, first couple times I seen it, it was killing me. I couldn't sleep at night. And, and I had to go talk to the chaplain. You know, I said, Father, I said, I'm, you know, I'm a Catholic kid from Chicago. I said, I should be doing this shit. Yeah. You know, and he told me, he says, look, Andres, he said, you know, nobody knows I became an infantry soldier. He says, this is all part of it. I mean, it's, don't go, you know, you can't go killing people or just murdering people. He said, but, you know, just use your, use your mind, use your intelligence. He says, you'll get through it. He says, just use your, with your, your brain, which I did. I mean, and, and there was a, you know, after, after Bruce got killed, I didn't care. I, didn't, I did not give a shit. So, Bruce on July 7th. I July 7th, yeah. and you... You don't get out of the army. I anymore. didn't. I wasn't leaving until the following January. I yeah. still had half my tour to go yet. So were you still in Vietnam all that time yeah. until January? Yeah. 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 See, I didn't. That was you had a, you had a full year in the combat. And I was there all the time. We, and we were we were in the field probably eighty nine percent of the time. We got to the rear air, rear area very infrequently. You know, we were in the field all the time. So. All the time. Um, you never thought of making a career of the army. No, 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 no. I was drafted. I just wanted to do my two years and get out. That was it. I just wanted to. But get you back. analyzed the training you received. I, and I you know got it, more but that was just to save my good, ass. And you were a good officer, uh, a non-commissioned officer, non-commissioned officer in Vietnam, but no, no chance of. No, I no. It was in fact when I when I went, I went up to the NCUA. We had a, I had a, a, a West Point graduate lieutenant, and we never got along. You know, he, we did things. He did things the wrong way. And he, he, almost, he called artillery on us one time because he couldn't read a map, you know. And thank God I was watching him. I'm going, sir, are you sure you got this right? And he goes, yeah. I said, have him, have him pop smoke one time. Have him put a smoke round in there. And he popped, and that smoke round led right in this. That was an HE round. He'd have killed all of us, you know. So me and him never got along good. Well, now, it's getting down time where I'm getting ready to go home. And uh, he wants me to take a patrol out. He says, there's a, a regiment of NVA up in the mountains. He says, take your five guys and see what you can find out. You know, and I'm going, you know, I, so I, I told my guys, I said, look, I said, we ain't going to go fuck with no regiment, you know. So we're going to go out and hide, spend the night out there. And uh, we'll tell the guys on guard out here, we're going to be out here. You know, if you hear something, don't fucking fire us up. You know, we're going to be out here. So anyway, he got wind of it. And this was on, this was in December. So he gave me an Article 15. Article 15 was, uh, uh, you know, a discipline action where you lose a stripe, you lose money. So December 2nd, I went down. I had to go to the colonel in the rear area, Colonel Colonel Anthony Herbert. He's a famous guy, isn't he? He was a famous guy. He, yeah. he, was, he wrote that book, Soldier. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was the CO down there at that time, and I went down to his office, and uh, I had previous, I'd just gone before the... The, uh, the board to get uh, get another strike. And I walked into his office and uh, he said, Andres, he says, uh, he says, I've got orders here for you for Spec 4 and I got orders for E6. He said, what do you want? He says, your pick. And I said, sir, I said, I got a month left in the Army. I don't fucking care. You pick it. He said, okay, specialist. And I was it. I got busted, but my last paycheck was for E5, so I never got nothing. So, then I got then then would it, ma would, it, would it have made a difference here no. last month? Whatever your strike you had? No, it didn't. No, no it didn't. Didn't mean anything. It just I, you know, a spec force patch on instead of a sergeant. But I did the whole time as a sergeant, so that's what I count myself as. Yes, yeah, that's sergeant E five. Yeah, that's yeah. what I count myself as. So you know, and uh, so okay, fine, big deal. You know, but the men you decided not to take out that night, they must have appreciated. Oh, it. of course they did. Yeah, they were, you know. Oh, they, Thanks, you know, we were together. I, my job was to get everybody back alive. I was using my brain. I, you know, I don't. I wasn't Audie Murphy. Let that to be somebody else. That was that wasn't me. I just got there to get there and go home. That was it. And I've already seen too many guys get killed. It wasn't going to be anymore. So now the last I, I had about 
two weeks left and I had a, a shoulder injury and I had my, my shoulder in a sling. And they brought me to the rear and I was on the bunker line. And on the bunker line and we were, we were hiding down there. You know, this was, they gave the, the short timers so you could get out of the field for a couple of days. So I'm getting ready to go home and I'm down on, on, the, on the line and now I'm sitting down there one night and I'm hiding. I ain't getting me on Vietnam no more. So I'm hiding and all of a sudden I see a little light come in there and this guy walks in and I look and I thought it was Ho Chi Minh. I thought they sent Ho Chi Minh after me. And I went, oh shit. And it was Carlos Saladino. Andres, what are you doing here? You know, a picture of what he looked yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 years ago. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, I, and I went, oh my God, you scared the shit out of me. And he goes, what are you doing here? I said, fuck, man, I'm going home. I'm out of here. He says, I'm leaving on the next plane. I'm, I'm hiding. So I, and I saw him maybe one more time, and then, and that was it. I got home and uh, went down to the company area. And going home was a, another treat, too. Got to the rear, and now I had to get to, I had to get from LZ Uplift maybe 30 miles to Phuket Air Force Base. All right? So is this another one of these? This is another one of those. So now... You got to turn your weapon in to your company clerk. All right? You pick up your records. They give you your records to go home, get on the plane. You got your travel orders, but they take your rifle away from you. Now you got no, and you got to you got to go down Highway One for 30 miles. I was throwing grenades in my pockets. I had I was loaded up, you know. I, so I went out to the road again, going to Phuket Air Force Base. Come on, we're going that way. Get on. And then that was it. Got to Phuket Air Force Base and. Uh, and I, I took a, a jet down to uh, Cameron Bay and did my final paperwork down there, and then it was bye-bye Vietnam. And that was when that plane left, got off the ground, and everybody started yelling and screaming and cheering. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah. So then I got home here, and I got home. It was January. It was probably 80-some degrees when I left Cameron Bay. When I got here, it was 15, 20 below. I got in here at 5 o'clock in the morning. I was one of the first guys processed. I was out. You know, the guy, guy comes up and he goes, okay, you're finished with the Army. And he called me, uh, uh, sir, Mr. Andres. He says, you're done with the Army. Thank you for your service. I got out. I went to Salem, SeaTac uh, 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 Airport in uh, Seattle, Washington. Got on a plane, came home. I landed in Chicago. I got in here about, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. I took the cab home from the airport. And it was cold, and, and I had a $20 bill that I had in my wallet the whole year that was for the cab driver that took me home. And it was a black guy. You know, and we pulled out in front of my apartment over on Spalding Avenue, and I gave the guy 20 bucks. I said, man, this is for you. This has been in my wallet all year long. And, and he goes, oh, man, he, come on, man. He says, I know where you've been. He said, you don't have to do this. I said, believe me. I said, this was, it's got your name on it. So I gave him the 20 bucks. He took off. I get out of the cab. And we walked in, and I lived in a basement apartment on Spalding Avenue. And you walk in, and you walk in the doorway, and you press the bell. And there was another door here, and then you walk right into my apartment. So I rang the bell. Now, my dad was home, and he thought my brother had just left for work, and he thought Jimmy forgot something and was coming back. So I go over to the door, and he opens the door, and I'm standing there. And they kind of knew I, know, I was about going home. And he's standing there going, ah, 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 ah. I'm going, fuck, open this door. I'm freezing out here. You know, and that was, that was it. I'm home. And that, that was the end of it. Your family was glad to see you. Did you have any difficulty adjusting to the Yeah, everybody bit? did. Every, everybody did. You know, I, I, slept, I still sleep with a light on at night. Yeah. You know, and uh, I still wake up with a start when there's a noise. Uh, yeah, it was it was difficult getting used to. It was. You know, um, did you have a? Could you have used the GI Bill or some version at that time? Yeah, you know, but I, I went to school for a couple of weeks, but man, I wanted to go party. And I fuck fuck this shit. I'm going to go have fun. You know, I went got my old job back, became a printer again, and uh, was gainfully employed. And I was never afraid to talk to anybody about Vietnam. If you wanted to hear it, I told the you. The gal that wrote to you, did she? I saw her. You know, we broke up oh, shortly broke after down. that. You know, it was that was. You know, it was. So the lady, completely different. the lady that you married, uh, she never saw you in uniform back in the day. No, 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 no. 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 And no. then did in you fact, when I when I took my uniform off, I never had it on again until the welcome home parade. And Carlos called me up that night out of the blue. I had not, I've seen him maybe 
two or three times in that 25 years. And uh, he calls me up that night and he says, he says, ah, come on, let's go to the parade tomorrow. I said, ah, yeah, I don't want to go to no parade. So he goes, okay. So he went down to the, the wall, was down at Olive Park that night. Olive Park was named after Milton, Milton Olive, yeah, who yeah. was at the once every mm -hmm. time. So he goes down to Olive Park that night, and he called me up that night, and he was pretty emotional. You know, he says, do me a favor, will you? He says, just for me. He said, will you do it for me? I said, okay. I said, for you, I'll do it for him. So we went downtown together, and when we... When I got out of that car and we saw everybody, that was that that, that was the, the big healing process. Yeah, you know, that was, you know, that was when to hear them people say thank you after all those years. It yeah. was, it was, it was therapeutic. I mean, yeah. it really was. And then I ran into a bunch of guys that I've served in Vietnam with and seen old buddies and and. So was that a beginning that and more. And regular communication. That's when yeah. I got involved with the veteran stuff. We started the chapter here for the 173rd, and uh, and is the 173rd chapter still meet? still still meet here? Yeah, we still meet, and uh, you know, but now we're all dying off now. Yeah, where do you meet? We meet. Uh, we change it, the venues all around the city here. Someday we'll be up in uh, once a year. For no, no, we well, once a month. Oh wow! Once a once a month we still meet, but it gets it's getting you know. Yeah. I, now I haven't been to a meeting, one of their meeting in a while. Uh, I go maybe four or five times a year, but yeah. uh, you know just to see the guys in that. But uh, but then I go to Kokomo every year, and uh, but I still get. I don't know Kokomo. Kokomo is a big Vietnam veterans reunion down in Indiana. Ah. And this was the 36th anniversary this year, and I've been to 30 of them. And uh, I, you know what, Neil, I really, really noticed how old we were getting this year. The numbers were down. All the guys who were there could hardly move. <laughs> it was like civil, the old Civil War guys you saw going back for every year. Yeah. So I am. Um, that was it. That was my, you know, and, and then now with this healing process, then I reached out and got a hold of Bruce's family. I went, found out where he was buried at. I went to his grave. Beautiful, yeah. I got in touch with Joel Lau's family, which with Joel Lau's family was kind of weird. Okay. How would we spell Mr. Lau's last name? L-A-U. 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 Now, Lau, he was, a, he was from Minneapolis, and his dad was a Protestant preacher. He was a minister. So one day there was a, a blurb in the 173rd newsletter that, did anybody know the circumstances of the death of Sergeant Joel Lau, blah, 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 November 1st, 1969? So I answered the newsletter, and I talked to this guy, and I said, I was with Joel when he got killed. And he says, well, he says, his mom and dad is still living. He says, do you mind if I give them your phone number? And I said, no. I said, by, by all means. You know? So one day I, had, I was working at a print shop out in Wheeling, Illinois. And I get a telephone call one day, and, and John Andres, and I said, yeah. And he goes, well, this is Mr. Lau. Wow. And I said, well, Mr. Lau, I'm glad to meet you. And he says, look, he says, me and the wife were driving through, you know, we're on vacation. He says, we're not too far away from you. Do mind if we come by and talk to you? And I said, sure, come on by. So we talked. You know, he came over, we met each other, and we had a good conversation. He was very bitter about seeing his son, about having his son die, especially with a couple weeks left. You know, he says, he says, the last time I talked to him, he said, I went out and put a down payment on a house for him. Next day I got a letter, he's dead. He says, it crushed me. He says, and another thing I'm pissed off about, his death caused my one son to be a drug addict. He says, it fucked up my whole family, Vietnam. Vietnam fucked up my whole family. So we said goodbye. I said, when I get home tonight, I, I, all the pictures I've got of Joel, I put in an envelope and I sent to him. I never heard back from him. Now, whether he was mad at me or he was pissed that I survived, but as years went by, and every year I put on the date of his death, I always put on Facebook now, Say what you want about Facebook. I always put a remembrance on them. A couple years ago, I got a telephone call, and she goes, "Are you the guy who does the remembrance of Joel?" Lau? And I said, "Yeah." I said, "It's me." She goes, "Well, I'm married to his brother." And I said, "Oh, really?" And she says, uh, "Do you mind if I have him talk to you because and he, nobody never knew the circumstances?" So I, he called me that night on the phone. I talked to him, and I said, "Well, I said if you want to hear the gory details, I said I'll let you know what happened." And he said, yeah. And, I, and then I told him the story about meeting his mom and dad. And he said, you know, John, he said, don't take that personally. He said, my dad was a tyrant. My dad, none of the kids liked him. 
He says, the reason Joel joined the army was to get away from the old man. And that's what his dad blamed himself on for that. And he, he just, he hated everybody, you know. So that, he says, but so don't take that seriously. He, he just, he hated everybody. It wasn't just you. Yeah. So, so that made me feel a little bit better. But I still, I still talk to him. Yeah. And, you know, now it's coming up. Now we're in October, November first. Yeah. going to be his anniversary. It's going to be uh, 49 years for him. Yeah. Have you been to the wall? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there several times. Several times. And the honor flight is and, and coming up. It's coming up. I've, I've signed up for that. In fact, I went to the wall on the 45th anniversary of Bruce getting killed. And I went to my wife and I said, you know what? I said. It's 45 years for Bruce. I'm spending the night with Bruce again. So I went down and got on the Amtrak train, took the train to Washington, didn't even get a hotel room. I went down there, I sat at the wall, and it started getting dark. I went and talked to the guy at the wall, and I said, you know, I said, told him what, what I was doing. I said, I want to spend another night with my buddy. And he said, well, he said, you know, it gets pretty dark down here. And I said, yeah, he says, he said, nobody will fuck with you. He says, just go sit, sit down there. He says, he says, the police will come by, you know, come by, check on it a couple times. So uh, I went down, I sat down there, and I sat down by, by his name on the wall. And, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, I, I started getting tired. So I rolled over in the grass, and I pulled my poncho liner up over me, and I was laying there, and I fell asleep. And then I, all of a sudden I hear some noise, and there were two bicycle policemen coming down the wall. So I just kind of stood there, and they rode right by me, never saw me. I, mean, I still got to see them. Yeah, I, 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 I still didn't see Oops, me. We got it, yeah, yeah. So it, it, that's, so, and I plan on doing that now for his 50th, the 50s next year, so yeah. next year I'll go back again. I, I sense we're coming to the end of the interview. There's always two questions okay. that we'd like to put to the sure. veterans. Uh, how do you think your military service and experiences affected your life? Well, for the one thing I always tell everybody, it taught me how to appreciate life. That, it, that was, the, when I came back from Vietnam, that was it. Every moment I wake up, every day, every, every time I look at the Grand Canyon, every time I go on vacation, I take, I got Bruce's poncho liner, he comes with me on every vacation. Uh, it, it makes me appreciate life. It's a powerful lesson. So it, yeah. is. It, it, yeah. it, it, it is. Yeah. It is. And um, I, you know, I mean, I knew this guy for six months out of my life. Yeah. But and he it, made that impression on me. Yeah. You know. Mr. Andrews, how do you think your military experience uh, influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, I, I'm, 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 you know, I think everybody, I think they should bring the draft back. I think everybody should have their stake in the game here, I, and, and I think it would benefit all these crazy kids now going around. It's, it's, it was great training. I don't know if I'd ever do it again. I don't know if I'd want my grandson to do it, but I am proud to say that I'm a Vietnam veteran, and, and it was great training, and I met some great guys. So that was, that's it. That's, uh, well, thank you for a wonderful uh, interview and for sharing the combat experience. It was good. Thanks for. Uh, yeah, it's it's good to talk. It's always it's always good to talk about it. It's therapeutic, and uh, you know, it's it's. You know, like I say it was the worst of times, but goddamn, it was the it was the best of times too. Thank you for your service. Thanks. Thank you.